So let's go right away into, uh, into something important to me, which is um, raise a big figure uh, in uh, Indian cinema and in the world cinema. But what I would like to know is about this, the shadow he puts around him, because he's, uh, he's like in control of everything, but it seems like it's a big tree and nothing can really grow under it. And um, Shamila Tagore told me, like, in order to grow, one had to leave him. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Okay. Uh, at one level, uh, I found Ray a very private person, a shy person at one level. At another level, extremely self-conscious, conscious of his presence, his sheer uh, physical height, which is quite uncommon among Bengalis, his voice, he was very conscious of all these. So he had this larger-than-life presence, which was quite awe-inspiring. And I can quite understand that people who would be staying too close to him would feel awfully inhibited. That would be quite natural. At the same time, uh, with his shyness, with his privateness, I found him in the 50s and the 60s particularly, to the middle of the 60s to be very precise, a small company of friends who are his peers, creative peers and intellectual peers, painters, musicians, artists, uh, thinkers, writers, anthropologists, and he shared a lot at one level with these people and took on fresh ideas, bits and pieces of information, checked his uh, thoughts about history because history remained a very major part of his filmmaking and his film thinking. Mm -hmm. So at that level, there was nothing inhibiting, nothing of that aura on these people. But over the years, the more he grew, these people, these peers, they seemed to dwindle. They seem to find uh, the space slightly uncomfortable, and they started drifting away. And Ray came to concentrate more and more on people very closely connected to his crew, his immediate surroundings, people who would take instructions from him, people who would follow him, rather than people with whom he could share. Very interesting. And go going from... Um, this statement. Could you could you go uh, into what you said in the car, like uh, the seventies or um, the end of the sixties was like a turning point in Ray's career, and that was the time when the Mai came in. Uh, in the mid sixties, particularly, I think with a film like Charulotta, which he considered uh, to be one of his major works, I think he came to the end of. Uh, circuit, a uh, phase. And from then on, he was moving into another direction. Where he had started, as you would remember, he was starting in revolt against Hollywood, in a kind of denial of Hollywood. He admired Hollywood, he loved Hollywood, he adored Hollywood as a viewer. But when he came to making films, he was trying to do something against Hollywood. And his models were Jean Renoir and the Italian New Realists. But after Charulotta, one can see, or maybe after Kancho and Jonka, already things were moving towards that end. But after Charulotta, he came more and more closer to Hollywood. It was the chamber play concept, treating a number of characters, quite fleshed out, detailed, bring them within a single space, a single limited space, more in the style of Sidney Lumet, The Twelve Angry Men, and those realistic Hollywood makers. More and more towards that. Very specific social problems. Problems of corruption, problems of uh, distorted power, problems of justice and injustice, treating problems directly and making films out of that, rather than the larger, more open, historical, critical space. Mm. So somehow, 
approaching Hollywood, moving towards Hollywood, and which I think uh, <coughs> reached a kind of climax when towards the end of his life, the Oscar reward came, which he cherished so much. And for a lot of us, it looked like Hollywood was recognizing a Hollywood master when the old Hollywood was dying out and the new American cinema was emerging. So it was a harking back to old Hollywood out in India. So all the big uh, fanfare over the Oscar to Ray, the way it was received here, the way it was received by Hollywood, I think it was Hollywood recognizing the Hollywood in Ray. And he was becoming, at this point, as his old friends and peers were moving out from his corpus, he was becoming larger than life. And he was becoming a kind of a figure rather than just a filmmaker at a different scale altogether. Mm -hmm. And as I was trying to tell you earlier when we were talking about this, you will get very few photographs of the person of the individual Ray from before uh, this period in the 50s or till the mid 60s. Photographs are rare to find, though he was such a colorful figure. So somehow this new image, he was casting himself in a way in the image of a John Ford, an Alfred Hitchcock, these great Hollywood masters who went about with a great of imaging, self-imaging. And somehow Nimai appeared on the scene right at that point. He was the right man at the right place. At the right point. And Ray was opening up. Ray wouldn't allow that kind of thing earlier to any photographer to move around his house, to get into any place in the house and shoot him just like that. But he was becoming larger than life and he would love this projection. So, do you mean by that that Ray kind of molded uh, Nehemiah to suit his requirements? Yes, very much so. And it had to do with the change of temper, the change of attitude to his own place, his films, and everything. Ray was changing in a very big way. And Ray was changing even as an image. So the image had to be built and cast and uh, circulated, reproduced. Mm. So you, you are talking also about uh, some kind of a super text emerging out of uh, Nemai's photograph. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, maybe I'll start with something uh, interesting that will give you a different kind of an insight. Yes. Uh, I did the first long TV interview that he ever gave to the Indian TV. This was back in 76, 77. And for two years he had been resisting the TV in India. He was chasing him and he would refuse because he was not happy with the production quality, with the standards of the Indian TV. He agreed only after two years. And he, he found that standards were proper. And uh, he was given the choice and he chose me to interview him. And uh, I remember when we were talking about this, and he insisted that we should discuss the whole thing in detail before we came to the interview. And we had three long sessions. And I had gone with the stock of questions. And after I had gone through the stock of questions, and he had also given me the answers that he were going to give to me when we came for the shoot, I asked him, since this was going to be the first ever TV interview in India, would he like to make any particular statement for the Indian viewers specifically and then I could frame a question so that he could give that answer so we were playing the game and the first thing he said well I'm the only filmmaker in India and like Ch Chaplin he brought in the name of Chaplin immediately who handles the entire making of cinema from writing the script to designing the costumes, to designing the sets, and even handling the camera. Because by then, and this was in the 70s, he was handling the camera himself. And the first two great peers who had worked with him, the creative peers in the first phase, Shubhrata Mitra and Banshi Chandra Kupta, they had both moved out. 
So he was very, very conscious of the fact. And that is the one point that he wanted to be underscored beyond my questions, that he was a maker who handled everything. So he was a master filmmaker. And the entire film was his territory. He controlled it. It was a one-man creative exercise, and that's how he looked at it. And the way Nimai was shooting him, in the process of his shooting, in the entire long process of working on a particular film, from the moment he started working on a script in his long uh, exercise books, these long sheets on which he worked, with the pictures coming along. He drew the pictures of the artists, the costumes, even small set details, all these. But right from then, all that was being shot by Marina. By, sorry, by, by Nima. Mm. So he was creating this text of the master filmmaker in complete control of the cinema and everything that went into the making of his films. That is what I call a super text growing out of all the films uh, that he was making and the man was shooting, step by step, stage by stage, till the final making. Mm. But again, it's a very strong statement you're putting here because uh, it's like Ray is very self-conscious of the importance of the of his own image to that appears to the world. So. Um, can you go a little bit more deep into how you think Ray kind of used Nemai to suit, uh, to suit these requirements? Uh, well, one simple thing, for example, whenever people would approach him for stills or for his own photographs, he would immediately refer them to Nemai. Mm. Uh, when I took the initiative of publishing the first ever script of Ray, which I edited, uh, the Opu Trilogy. When I went and he agreed to let us print it, we talked about it, and when I asked for pictures, for photographs, all kinds of stills, he said, go to Nimai and talk to him, uh, him. And he also insisted on briefing Nimai beforehand, even before I went, of what kind of photographic material should go into the book. And the photographic material that he chose for us, he made a larger choice and we chose out of that. And these Nimai had kept ready for me. And that was the first time when I really started working with Nimai directly with this stuff, with this material. I'd known him from a distance, but this is the time when I first worked with him. And I found that he had chosen pictures for his sketches, his preliminary sketches, Ray at the shooting spot, shooting, briefing his actors. There's quite a large stock of photographs of Ray with the actor, treating him as almost a student, teaching him, briefing him in details. And these he had photographed by Nimai. <clears throat> so that role he was getting recorded, documented, photographically consistently. And when we was choosing photographs for any project that somebody else was doing, he was also making his choice. And that choice would center around all these different aspects of filmmaking. The point that he made when I went to interview him, that he was a chaplain. And now going maybe more into uh, psychology, how do you think it's possible to follow one man, even as you say, he's a very majestic figure, he's a very interesting person, but how can you like, uh, give away 25 years of your life just being obsessed by one model? How do you think that, that's possible? I think, there are <clears throat> I think there were two or three factors involved. Uh, a, uh, Nima is a theatre person and he has always been a great admirer of actors. Uh, I have worked with his theatre photographs also and there's a book of his theatre photographs. I prepared the text for that. And I found one of the limitations, one of the problems of his theatre photography was that he was not ultimately 
shooting a, a, a whole dramatic scenario, the whole dramatic scene, he would pick out the big actor, the big actress, and he would focus more on that. It would, it would be very, very difficult to find a shot of a really dramatic scene with different characters interacting and to see the whole ensemble in the act. There are very rare photographs of an ensemble, of, a, of even four or five actors interacting on the stage together. It would always be focusing, centering on the single big actor or the big actress in a mood. So there was this tendency, this tendency to dramatize an individual in isolation from his setting, from the other people, from what was happening around him. This was something that was there right from the beginning. And he chose Ray as his first subject. Uh, I don't know what thought went into it, but maybe the most dramatic individual available. And that is how it started. And what I learned from Nimai is that initially, Ray was quite reserved, was holding himself back. But slowly, over the years, he started softening, and uh, Nimai could hover around him all the time. But that didn't happen right at the beginning. And I think that had a lot to do with Ray also growing into that other image. So this was a process. It didn't start suddenly. And maybe even looking at Nimai's photographs, which he relished looking at, which he loved offering to people when people came to ask him for a photograph. You choose these photographs and sign these photographs occasionally for people. So he was also coming to love the photographs. He was coming to love his own image. And that was growing at his stage. And this becomes a fascinating game for Nimai also. Uh, because he had come into photography, as he, is, he must have told you, when he discovered suddenly this abandoned camera in a camp. So he hadn't come to photography with a vision of photography, whether he would be choosing the figures or landscapes or fashion, the, the different choices that any modern practicing professional would have. He didn't start with that kind of a clear thinking or a vision about photography. So discovering Ray, focusing on Ray, and then finding this whole thing quite fascinating. And this becomes a kind of a game for Nimai. And I've tried to probe, uh, when talking to Nimai, of his, his view of Ray, his vision of Ray, his understanding of Ray. I, I haven't really got too much out of him. And I haven't found situations even when I have found Ray and Nima together, of the two of them talking about something, any subject whatsoever, even about filmmaking or about other things. And Ray was a good conversationist, a good talker. He, he loved talking. And it was a joy listening to him. But with Nima, I, I never found him talking about any of his concerns. So Nimai would be a silent observer. Hovering around would be the word. Hovering around like a spirit around him and shooting and capturing him at unexpected moments even. 